John chapter 19, beginning at the end of verse 16. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now the writers of the Gospels have read the crucifixion of Jesus through two very specific lenses. The lens of Isaiah 53, and the lens of Psalm 22. Now, there are allusions to other scriptures, particularly to other psalms throughout the gospel retellings of Jesus' crucifixion. But the preponderance of the references are to these two passages. And in our discussion today, we're going to discuss Psalm 22. Both Matthew and Mark record Jesus as quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, as he hung on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention that the soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes, which is an allusion to Psalm 22, verse 19. The mocking of Jesus in all the Gospels seems reminiscent of Psalm 22, verses 7 through 9. And the, in, the event of the entire crucifixion of Jesus seems eerily reminiscent of Psalm 22, 13 to 18. Jesus' experience at Calvary is all over this psalm. Now, in the other Gospels, these references to Psalm 22 are... Um, they're implied, they're inferred. But the Gospel of John references this psalm directly. When John recounts the casting of lots for Jesus' clothing, unlike the other Gospels, he doesn't just reference it, but he specifically cites the passage that it fulfills. Psalm twenty-two nineteen. He does that in John nineteen twenty-four. 
John also joins the other Gospels in recognizing that Jesus' statement, I am thirsty, is a fulfillment of the Scriptures, specifically Psalm twenty-two sixteen. And John presents the incident when the soldier stabs Jesus in his side and, water, and blood and water flow out of him as another allusion to Psalm 22. This time, Psalm 22, verse 15. We're going to read the psalm together, but not all at once. I'm going to do it in pieces. But what I want us to recognize today is the abandonment of Jesus on the cross. The cry of dereliction that we see in Matthew and Mark, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is not present in John. And Jesus is not truly forsaken in John, nor was he truly forsaken in the other Gospels. But in John, he does have a crowd of people supporting him as he dies, mostly women, but also the Gospel writer, also John himself. But the dereliction is there for Jesus. There is no moment in Jesus' life in which he is more um, apparently abandoned by the Father than as he dies on the cross. Most of us believe when we follow God that these are situations he will protect us from. But Jesus discovered that this road was the only road God would have him walk, even though he prayed to avoid it. And what I want us to think about today as we ourselves stand in the dark is that Jesus shows us how to walk through dark seasons of our lives. He goes before us in this way to show us the way. Not only the way, and we talk about the way of Jesus, of being a way of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and hospitality, and certainly those are all things Jesus helps us with. But he also helps us as we walk through a valley in which we feel forsaken. He goes before us in that as well. The way of suffering, the way of forsakenness, the way of abandonment, and the way of death. These two, Jesus blazes a trail in front of us. Now we know that God did not truly forsake Jesus. God raised him from the dead. But he certainly looked forsaken on the cross. And by Jesus' own testimony, he seems to have felt forsaken as well. We don't always experience God's watch care. The promises made to our ancestors do not always ring true to our experience. What are we to do in seasons like these? That's really the subject of what we're going to talk about today. So today, as we think upon Psalm 22 in the light of Jesus' crucifixion, and as we think upon Jesus' crucifixion in light of Psalm 22, I want to consider four questions together. Have you ever felt forsaken by God? Is the first question. The second is, have you ever felt forsaken by people? And I'm using the word felt in both cases. Because this is not a theological statement on whether God actually distances himself, or other people do. But our experience is all we have. These are the only eyes through which we can see. And so felt is the right word. Have you ever felt forsaken by people? In those seasons, to whom do you cry? That's the third question. And the fourth, in whom do you put your hope? We'll deal with each of those today. We're going to begin by the, with the question, have you ever felt forsaken by God? Look with me at Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. And we remind ourselves that the Psalms are prayers prayed to God out of various experiences of the people of Israel. And so some Psalms are very positive. And you pray positively and sing positively when things are going well. And some Psalms are very dark and very difficult. And you and I go through those seasons too. So the Psalms help us to learn how to pray. And the prayer that's prayed in Psalm 22, and how to praise for that matter, but the, psalm that, the song that is prayed in Psalm 22 is one of dereliction. These are the first five verses. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. The essence of the beginning of this psalm is that he knows his theology well, the psalmist. And this is a psalm of David. He knows what has been said 
of God and the way in which he delivered his people from slavery in Egypt and the way in which he fed them in the wilderness with manna and the way in which he delivered them from the enemies that attacked them while they were vulnerable during those 40 years of wandering. And he knows that God was with them as Joshua led them into the land of Canaan for conquest. But in his experience at the moment that he's living, none of that seems true at all. God seems to have abandoned him. And so he reminds God of who he's been told God is, but he cries out for help from a God that seems not willing to do so. That's the moment of abandonment. This is the experience of humanity, and it's experience that Jesus had as well. We will all face seasons in which our personal experience denies the testimony of our ancestors, in which the promises that God has been professed as making will seem as dust in our hands and as untruths in our mouths. Now that's not the reality, but the experience is real. Sometimes, and we have to admit this, there's no going forward if we can't. Sometimes the heavens are shut to us and God does not answer because we pray to false gods and they cannot answer. Other times, our sins have interrupted the relationship that we have with God. Our rebellions and the other things that we brought into our lives separate us. And if there is rebellion in our lives, then God's silence is at least understandable. It's explainable. God said to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 20, now this is the old covenant. This is the covenant of Sinai. The Jewish people agreed to it. Gentiles did not. But it still reveals to us the consequences of a breach in relationship with God, the kind of things that happen when a people separate themselves because God protects us from way more than we are aware. But this is what he warned the Israelites, that there would be separation if they refused to follow him and they breached the relationship that he had with them and they refused to submit and they just ran off into rebellion, this is what would happen. This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 20. The Lord will send upon you disaster, panic, and frustration in everything you attempt to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make pestilence cling to you until it has consumed you off the land that you are entering to possess. The Lord will afflict you with consumption, fever, inflammation, with fiery heat and drought, and with blight and mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. The sky over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land into powder, and only dust shall come down upon you from the sky until you are destroyed. If there is rebellion like this, then God's silence is not mysterious. It is the prayer of the righteous person that's powerful and effective. God hears those who he is in relationship with. And if we breach that relationship, then silence is an inevitable result. But with this person I've been talking about who I sat with, and I did not sense that at all. And Jesus was innocent. He was not, the relationship with God and his ability to hear from the Father was not interrupted by his own sins or by his own rebellion. In fact, Entering into that darkness was the will of the Father. Jesus could not have been more obedient. And what Jesus shows us is that sometimes God gives his own people, whom he loves, the cup of suffering to drink. And as we learn in the book of Job, sometimes only God knows why we are there. But Jesus has gone before us he entered this very space that most of us fear ever entering. And because he went there first, we who follow him can learn how to endure. Have you ever felt forsaken by God? Second question, have you ever felt forsaken by people? This is the experience of the psalmist. Not only has God abandoned him, but so have those who would be friends, those who would be his subjects. This is David. Those who should be defending him have turned as well. We don't know when this is written, maybe when he was fleeing from Saul. Look at Psalm 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. 
There's little worse in life than being mocked publicly by others. And the cut is deeper still if the others who are mocking pretended to be friends. Dallas Willard, in his book, Hearing God, here's a quotation from this about the power of words and what it feels like to be abandoned. The power of the word, Willard writes, lies finally in the personality that it conveys. Children learn to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Adults teach them to say this in order to ease the terrible pain that really is inflicted on them by the words of their playmates. How deeply children can be hurt by words. The school playground can become a chamber of horrors where young souls are left permanently crippled and scarred by malicious or mindless chatter. Jesus saw this, no doubt, for he had eyes that saw. He also saw adults ravaging the lives of little children with their words. Surely it was largely his sense of the damage done in this way that made him say, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it'd be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18.6 The true view of the power of words is forcefully given in the book of Proverbs. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18.21 A soft tongue can break bones. Proverbs 25.15 A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15 verse 4 This theme is carried into the New Testament, Willard goes on to write. James remarks that the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. It's James 3, chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus himself regarded words as a direct revelation of our inner being. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Now again, as difficult as it is to be abandoned by people, sometimes we do deserve it. There's no way to cover this subject and not admit it. Sometimes we deserve to be chastised. Sometimes we deserve to be rebuked. Proverbs 15.10 reminds us, There is severe discipline for one who forsakes the way, but one who hates a rebuke will die. And if we deserve to be rebuked, then we should receive it with thanksgiving, even if it is humiliating. However, there is a difference between being rebuked and being mocked. And many of us are ridiculed for things that are either no fault of our own or are complete fabrications. And this is what happened to Jesus. Jesus, too, though innocent and righteous, was ridiculed, railroaded, and sentenced to death. And without him, we might think that was a road that should never be walked by anybody. But he, again, is our trailblazer. He blazes the path ahead of us to show us not only to walk through good times and times of plenty, not only to love and to forgive and to turn the other cheek, but also how to endure injustice and the forsaking of people that should be protecting of us. And because Jesus has gone before us, we who follow him can learn how to endure. What do we do in these situations? The third question is, to whom do you cry? Look at Psalm 22, verse 9. Let's see if we can learn from the psalmist. And of course, Jesus fulfills this in his experience as well. Psalm 22, verse 9. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe. He's praying to God on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there's no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me, a company company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. 
I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the, afflicted, the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. When we feel forsaken by God, or by other humans, or in the worst cases by both at the same time, the instinct of the worldly is to cry out to other humans. We do this through gossip. We do it through protests. We do it through violence. We do it through rebellion. We do it through self-harming behaviors. We do it through vindictiveness. We don't see Jesus doing this. We don't see Jesus gathering a rally to protect himself. We don't see Jesus crying out to Pilate or to Herod and begging them for mercy. Jesus, like the psalmist, cries out to God. For those of us who have been the victims of injustice, we would do well to remember that we will never find justice in human hearts. Humans do what is in their best interest, but true justice is distant from us. Only God can bring justice. And we're told in the scriptures that he takes up the cause of the afflicted and of the oppressed. If we would rely on him, he will save us. I find most Christians are functionally deists when it comes to God's role in bringing justice on the earth. A deist is somebody who believes that God is sitting up there far distant from our problems and he's sort of letting us figure things out on our own. That's a deist. Sometimes we're forced to live that way, especially during seasons when God seems to be silent. But deists don't ever expect God to show up. Deists believe that we only have ourselves on which to rely. And the only prayers or petitions that have any chance of bringing justice on the earth are petitions made to human rulers. And that's understandable. Because God does not always answer our prayers quickly. And his justice comes slowly. And sometimes we want it quicker. And humans are more reliable. Because they're easier to manipulate. Others know that their cause is not just. And so they would not pray to God. Because they have little chance of God standing up for them. And so humans, again, are easier to manipulate and deceive. So again, we cry to them. But for those of us who follow Jesus, Jesus is our role model. He is our exemplar. He's the one whom we follow. Most of us would rather follow another voice. In fact, though, allowing God to take up our cause is what forgiveness is. To forgive means to neglect. It doesn't mean to say that was, what was done to us was right or good or fine. It's not to release people from the responsibility they bear and the evil that they've done. We don't have the authority to do that. Only God can truly forgive. When we forgive, what we do is we give the debts that others owe to us. We give them to God. And we trust Him to collect those debts. That's what forgiveness is. It's taking the debts that others owe us because of what they've done and giving them to God to collect and trusting that the one who is just and is the righteous judge of all the earth will take up our cause and do what is right, even if what he decides to do is not what I would have done. I must trust him. That's what forgiveness is. And there is no way to forgive and then to collect the debts owed to us. If we collect the debts, then it's on us to bring justice. If we give the debts to God, then justice lies in his hands. For the people of God, there's only one way, and it's the way of Jesus. Jesus did not wreak vengeance on the people of the earth, even though they treated him as they did. He gave them to God and entrusted the judgment to fall to the Father. And one day he will come. Our instincts, though, will always be to collect these debts on our own. Either to do it ourselves if we have the power or to call upon others who we see as more powerful to collect those debts for us. And these are not the ways of Jesus. 
When we feel forsaken by God or other humans, those who follow Jesus must entrust their cries and their justice only to him. The final question this morning is, in whom do you hope? In whom do you hope? Look at Psalm 22, now in verse 26. Psalmist writes, The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. None of this is true to the psalmist's experience. We've already read what he was experiencing at the beginning of the psalm. Nothing he says here is true to the life he's living, and yet he confesses it nonetheless. When we feel forsaken by God and by people, the instinct of the world is to despair and to demand justice now for me, in my life. Vindicate me now. This was not the example of Jesus, nor was it the example of the psalmist to whom Jesus points us. Jesus entrusted his vindication to God And God vindicated him, not in saving him from death, but in his resurrection from the dead. The psalmist, too, looks to a future time when the promises that God made to his ancestors will be true. They're not true in his life or in his experience, but he confesses a time that they will be true, and he puts his hope in a future he cannot see. Both rejoiced in the fulfillment of God's promises knowing that God would do as he had promised. In his own time, the people of God must persevere till the promises of God are fulfilled. Many of us try to get his promises before he's willing to give them. There was a time in our culture, it seems to have been in the fabric of our culture, maybe in all of the West, where it was seen as an ethical thing to lay down our present for a future we couldn't see. But something has changed Could our ancestors have imagined a day in which it would become so routine to sacrifice an unborn unborn child so that I can have a better present and so that I can have a better future? That we would sacrifice the future for our present happiness is an indication of the kind of people we are. And this is not the way of Jesus. Jesus sacrificed no one for his own happiness, but he sacrificed himself for the joy set before him. Where are these people now? Where are the people of God in a day in which the selfishness of people is seen as a good and positive thing, ensconced in law, encouraged in culture and media, and we see it working itself out everywhere we look? When we feel forsaken by God or by other humans, those who follow Jesus, Embrace our own suffering for the joy set before us. We wait for justice till Jesus comes because we know that the only true justice we'll ever receive will come from the hands of the one who laid down his life for us. Why does God make us walk through these seasons? Why do we enter them? Listen to these words from C.S. Lewis. I think they're penetrating. Just remember, they are spoken by a demon. So you got to get that in your head. And that is where the troughs come in. You must have often wondered why the enemy, why God, does not make more use of his power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree he chooses and at any moment. But you now see that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. Merely to override a human will, as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most mitigated degree would certainly do, would be for him useless. He cannot ravish, he can only woo, for his ignoble idea is to eat the cake and have it. The creatures are to be one with him, but yet themselves, 
merely to cancel them or assimilate them will not serve. He's prepared to do a little overriding at the beginning. He'll set them off with communications of his presence, which, though faint, seem great to them, with emotional sweetness and easy conquest over temptation. But he never allows this state of affairs to last long. Sooner or later, he withdraws, if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience, all those supports and incentives. He leaves the creature to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have lost all relish. It's during such trough periods, much more than during the peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature he wants it to be. Hence, the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which please him best. Now, we can drag our patients along by continual tempting because we design them only for the table. And the more their will is interfered with, the better. He cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. And if only the will to walk is really there, he's pleased even with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. This is the opportunity that affords us in the dark. It's in the dark that we reveal who we really are. God's withdrawal is like a test. It's like an exam. Human injustice is the same. When we are abandoned by God, we are being tested. When we are abandoned by people, we are being tested. It's only in those moments that we see how far we've come with God and how much farther we still have to go. What comes out of us in the night was in us in the light. And until we enter the dark, we do not know where we are or where we stand. God forces all those he loves to go through seasons of forsakenness. Some are longer than others, and only God can answer the question why. But all of these are opportunities to grow and to be tested. These seasons are essential if we're to be beings made in his image. If God wanted robots or hand puppets, we would not go through any of this. It would be unnecessary. But because he is insistent that we become mature adults, every parent who has ever raised a child knows If you protect your children from all the consequences of their decision, they will never mature. If you give them everything they ask for, they will never grow up and know how to endure want and lack. Good parents know the suffering of their children is necessary for them to grow into the people that God has intended them to be. And God knows that about you too. If we're to be beings made in his image, We will find ourselves in these seasons. And when we do, God will see in whom we put our trust. To whom do we cry? And in whom do we hope?